Hello, everyone, and welcome to this is writer's workshop where we talk about um, nonfiction writing books. And I'm so excited for you guys to be here on this Saturday. Thank you for giving us an hour of your time. And I would love for my lovely co-hosts to introduce themselves, starting with um, Caro. Hi, my name is Caro Brown. I'm an urban fantasy author and the operations director over at Otherworld Inc. Uh, I am in a different recording location because actually both of these dogs that are here with me right now are sick. Oh. <laughs> And so I'm doing doggy mom diligence. Now you're here too. I'm doing doggy mom diligence and I'm hanging out with them and doing Aww. it. That's so nice. I did not make her stream, by the way. I was like, you can, you know, opt out. And she was like, I will do it. And I was like, all right, well, don't, uh, don't kill me. That's fine. Carol cannot be shot. <laughs> Lay down. Get away from my mic. I have to say that to Mike all the time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, hello, I, Kate. I see a wild Kate. Is there a wild Kate? Yeah. There's a wild, wild Kate. Kate. Oh, hello, wild Kate. All right, Sky. We haven't seen you in a while. I'm so glad you're here. I know. I have a line. Hi, Hi, uh, my name is Sky. I typically write paranormal romance under the name SD Hagas, and I have not been on anyone's live stream since January. Maybe yeah. earlier than that. That no, January. Right. January, yeah. We're wedged. So, I'm alive. Show. That's mm -hmm. all I got. <laughs> Lisa? Uh, so, I'm Lisa Daly. I write both uh, nonfiction and fiction, mostly romantic comedies. And over on my channel, uh, I mostly do writing advice. So, if you are looking to write a book you're super proud of and get it published, that's a good channel to hang out on. Excellent. Um, my name is Tamara Woods, and I talk about cozy mysteries and books, coffee, and tacos, not necessarily in that order. And today we are talking about this book, On Writing Well by William Zinzer. And this is one of those books that's kind of a. Uh -oh. Let's just mute that for a second. Uh, <laughs> no problem. Um, you know, you got a puppy bed puppy pile all your beds so there's going to be some puppy talks um so this is one of those nonfiction kind of classics and he is more discussing um non-fiction writing versus fiction writing but i know a lot of us do blogs we do marketing we do articles we end up taking forays into the non-fiction world so i thought that this could be a good choice though i didn't think anyone was going to pick it but our good read, our good reads group surprised me, and they picked it. So that's what we're here talking about. And I'll let y'all know what they picked for May at the end of the stream. So let's see who's here with us, and then we'll get started with the chatting. And let me know if you have read this book and what you thought about it. So Sarah's here doing the good work of asking folks to press the like button. I mean, you don't have to, but it'd make me feel good in my heart. Hi, Elizabeth. So glad to see you. Carol pulling double duty. CJ is normally on the panel, but she's out and about. So I appreciate you being on your cell phone and saying hello to us. Double duty sky. Hello. Hi, CEO. So glad to see you. That's me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Daria. Amber's also sometimes on the panel, but a storm threw you out of being live. Oh, I appreciate you being here. And that's, I will fight that storm. I will fight it. Hi, Devin. Sarah saying how I'm feeling in the comments. I'm not going to click on that because that just feels, you know, that has swears. There's Lisa. Yeah. Devin. Hello, Devin. <laughs> things moved. Things moved. Ba -ba -ba. Hi, Kate. I'm glad that you're here. <laughs> At least we didn't give you the wild treatment. No. Wild. <laughs> wild. <laughs> so ridiculous. <laughs> Hi, Vampire Assassin. So glad to see you here. It's a cool and, one. Right? Every time I'm like, oh, that's so good. Hello, Barbara. 
Hello, Jet G. Have I met you before? That's such a cute avatar. You're waiting for your digital copy from the library. You know what? I actually, I, cause I, I bought this copy, gosh, like seven, eight years ago. So, you know, it's really been hot on top of my uh, TBR list. <laughs> and, <laughs> and it's been so long that I had lost it. So I reserved a copy in my library, but I ended up finding my paperback copy and then the digital hold came through. I was like, what? That never happens. Hello, Allie. Need to get some words down for today. That's wonderful. Well, I hope that we inspire you to write more words, even though we won't be doing writing sprints for this one because this is a book club. Hi, Autumn. All right. So it looks like Destiny's here. You got the book today and only read the first five chapters. Well, it's pretty fast for today. Yeah. That's pretty fast, but Destiny is like a writing queen, so I'm sure reading goes pretty quickly, too. It looks like there's folks who have looked at it and folks that haven't yet. Hi, Sarah. It's been a long time, actually. I feel that. And hello, Joel. So let's get started. I think that wraps it up for the comments. And of course, if you guys have any thoughts, feelings, chime in i'll be clicking and checking so um like i said this is a nonfiction work and it was originally published in 1976 and it's been updated several times and the last time was um 2006 so it has been updated though sometimes it did feel a bit antiquated and i i think that's one of the well, first, I want to know, what are y'all's, like, general overall thoughts? Like, how did you feel reading this? Was this a hard read for you? Did it go easily? Did you, and what form did you read? Paperback, ebook, audiobook? So I read, or rather, I listened to the audiobook version, and it was actually read by the author. And if you want, like, a calm, mellow voice to put you to sleep at night, that's your guy <laughs> right there. Um it was, I really kind of liked listening to what he had to say. There were some parts where, like, I was listening to him while I was, like, you know, cleaning the house or something. I was like, I, I don't think that, that that idea has aged well at this point. Like, the, the, I was having a lot of that every now and then. I read the paperback, and guess what, y'all? <laughs> I've forgotten how to read freaking paperbacks. Um <laughs> You know what? When you're laying in bed at two o'clock in the morning trying to read a book, you can't see it as well as you can your Kindle Fire, Tamara. So <laughs> that was like a whole thing. <laughs> That's terrible. True, but terrible. Gosh. I actually realized that I read this book before. I oh. read it in it was assigned to me in college, and I did not remember that from the title. I did not remember it until I started reading. And you know, at the very uh, beginning of the introduction where he's talking about having the picture of E.B. White over his um, over his office or something with just a typewriter and the big barrel for the trash. Um, I was like, oh my God, I've read this before. <laughs> um, but I, there are parts of it that I really did like. I think that uh, later on it, Certainly it's not a page turner, I'll say that. But I, I did think that that there was some good uh, advice in there. But yeah, I uh, it's, a, it's a little bit of a dry read. That said, I don't think, even though it's a book for nonfiction, and in particular, I think he meant it for journalists when he originally wrote it, and then he sort of tacked on other stuff after that. I do think that a lot of his ideas apply to a lot of different parts of writing. In particular, the idea of sort of cutting all the stuff that you don't actually need, that you know, just sort of piling on extra craps, <laughs> extra word crap, <laughs> that, it doesn't, that it does not enhance your writing, it actually diminishes that. And that is something that is like the one thing I remember taking away from it the first time I read it. So I don't want to make it that. I do wonder if I was assigned this in um, journalism school, I remember reading the first chapter, but there was, you know, there was a few books that if it was boring, y'all, I had Drake to do Thirsty Thursdays. I couldn't be bothered <laughs> with your boring assignments. <laughs> Sky, 
I read the ebook version, um, and like everyone else has said, there was some parts of it that I felt were really good, and then there was a lot of parts that I was just like, what in the world? And that being said, there was one part, I finished it this morning for those who are curious, like five minutes before we streamed, actually. And, um, Hashtag relatable, I'll say <laughs> One of the things that I actually, with the updated version, I wish they had left in was where he started. To, he mentions that um, things have changed with the updates, including the fact of how describing how to use processors, computer processors versus typewriters. And I think it would have been really cool to have read that as well. Even though it would have been aged, it would have been interesting to see how things have changed from when he first wrote the book to when to now, basically. I could see that. I could definitely see that. So piggybacking off of what Lisa was saying, um, one of the things that he definitely stressed was decluttering your writing and simplifying um, some of the first few chapters, simpl simplicity, clutter, style. Um, one, one technique that he mentioned that I thought was interesting, and I think I'm gonna try to apply this to my beta reading, was um, he he taught um, editing, writing, etc., and he said that he would use brackets to point out words that could be deleted, and I was like, oh, that's smart because then it gives the writer the opportunity to like look over it without that line through the words and to decide whether or not you know what they wrote works and if that would that changing that bit would like change things you know. Mm -hmm for their writing and change their voice. Um, what were some things that y'all found from like his decluttering advice and his simplification advice that you thought worked for you or wouldn't work for you? Well, I did also really like the part about the brackets. And I, I thought the way that he described it was very respectful to other writers that part of his process instead of, you know, cutting these things out uh, was that he wanted to, sort of leave their words untouched, but just kind of shine a spotlight on areas where they could cut. And and I thought this idea of taking anything you wrote and cutting it down by half was sort of insane. Terrifying. <laughs> that was the part where I was just like, excuse me, you don't know me. I am the yeah. overwriter. You're telling me to cut my words in half? Mm -mm. But yeah. like, I did kind of think about that, though, because when I do my academic writing, outside of making sure that I have to hit like that minimum word count, like I was wondering, like, you know, what can I say that's not, you know, cluttering up my words like that. And one of the things that he said while he was talking about that is making sure that your voice shines through. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I've been kind of working on in these college discussions at this point is I'm trying to still declutter everything. But instead of having like that academic like pedagogy essay talk, I've actually just tried to put my voice in there and I've gotten a lot more engagement from everybody else in the class. And I haven't gotten smacked by the instructor yet. So I'm going to keep doing it. I think that's good. I think that's really good. I, it did occur to me, you know how in this story he, or in the beginning of the book, he gives that anecdote about being on a panel with another writer and how it's for him, it's this laborious process and he's writing and writing and he's editing and it's work and you gotta sit down in your chair every day and it's this terrible thing. And then he's on the panel with this doctor who is basically you know, being a surgeon all day and then coming home and writing stories at night and has been published and is having an entirely different experience with the writing. And, and at first I'm thinking, you know, he's going to he's going to tell us afterwards because this is not a part I remembered from the first time I read it. Uh, I'm thinking that he's going to, you know, to tell the reader that this guy's not taking things seriously or what. But what he basically says is he's just fascinated by his process and how it can be so vastly different. And as I was reading his description of how he writes and how much, you know, how many revisions he makes and how many edits he makes, I'm thinking that he's probably a pantser that right that a lot of people sort of need to write in order to think through what they want to say and my friend lisa mcleod who writes uh business nonfiction, she 
writes draft after draft after draft because she needs the process of writing to actually figure out what she wants to say versus somebody like me, more of a plotter. I already know what I want to say before I get started. And at least I know where point, you know, I, I know where I'm going, um, whether it's nonfiction or in a story, I know how things are going to end. I might be surprised along the way, but I know the general, I'm, I know I'm heading towards, you know, California. Well, when you're doing business writing, though, I think that he focused very much on kind of um, simplifying his writing. So I would th I would think with that, even if he went in with the outline, then he probably would rewrite a lot because okay. that's like that was kind of like his goal was to filter it all out. Um, yeah, that was a part that I highlighted here. He said, um, for there isn't any right way to do mm -hmm. such personal work. There are all kinds of writers and all kinds of methods. And any method that helps you to say what you want to say is the right method for you. Yeah. And that was definitely a quote that I wanted to read to y'all because I felt like that was like, that's like my bread and butter. Your miles may vary. None right. of the none of the rules are always right you know my process is not right for necessarily anyone here <laughs> like, and that's fine because it's mine and hopefully it works for me or i can tweak it to make it better yeah i think there are a lot of writers that need to go through multiple drafts in order to sort of find that right so, <laughs> so to find that gem of a story and i and i think that uh, yeah, I, I did. I thought it was great. And I and it was surprising to me because you're talking about a guy who's taught writing for a hundred years at Yale. And so the idea that he would be so open to somebody else's process and so fascinated by it and and have enough have this experience, have enough of an impact on him that he's gonna, you know, put it into his his book. I I, I thought that was really great. Now I still think that no matter how you experience his class, you're still getting a lot of brackets. You know? <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm absolutely yeah. sure. Probably. Sarah said that um, she read it in the creative writing, creative nonfiction class. Man, I really feel like this was assigned to me. <laughs> I really feel it like, because I took a creative nonfiction class as well. Um, so one thing I wanted to talk about was he discussed finding your audience mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. he discussed um, writing for yourself versus writing for your ideal reader. And mm -hmm. he was very much a proponent of writing for yourself. Like this process is supposed to please you. You're supposed to enjoy it. This is about you. Wow. And I was like, Oh wow. What an interesting perspective because you know, modern 2020, it's like, Who's your ideal reader? How do you reach them? How do you write the way your ideal reader writes? And you hit those things that your ideal reader wants to read. So I wanted to hear your thoughts on this. Like, what do you think of how that that idea stacks up against now? Is there a way to like marry these two? I totally think so. You, I keep talking though. You guys go. I. It was very interesting for me to read that because when I first started writing, that was my mindset. It's only been since trying to hit the publishing side that my mindset has gone back towards the marking version of you need to find your ideal reader. Because back when I first started writing, when I was just writing to tell stories, my ideal reader was me. I wanted to write the stories that I would later go back and read over and over again. And so it's interesting to see how he's basically saying that my earlier mindset was right all along. And I was just like, huh, maybe I should go back to writing for me and see what happens. It kind so. of mirrors Stephen King's comment in On Writing where he says, write with the door closed and edit with the door open. It kind of mirrors that idea, which I really mm -hmm. did like. And I like that that's a concept that a lot of, um, you know, experienced writers, you know, tend to kind of lean towards as they get more proficient within their career. So I thought that was really good. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's really hard for people when they first start writing with the idea of getting published because they're always going to think about what people are going to say and what they're going to do. And that's where a lot of the writer block comes in. So mm -hmm. I personally think it's a great advice that maybe I should follow too. We're small steps, y'all. Yeah. yeah I, I, I Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Um, I feel like 
putting all the pressure on the publishing and the marketing and the end result, which is another thing that I discussed that I want to get to, like that focus on the end product as opposed to the whole process. Um, I feel like that focus has um, not killed the enjoyment for me, but it has definitely marred it. Like it's gi it's given it a mark, and I I I'm tired of that because I've been writing for the majority of my life and I've always loved it. So I want to still love it. <laughs> I yeah. don't want the love to die because no. I'm like, I need to sell a book. Yeah. You know what I, I, mean? think, I think that's really, really important. I mean, I, I have, I actually came at this from the opposite perspective and that was that I have, I have always written books that I, um, that I really wanted to write and with one exception and it was an error that I will not repeat with my fiction. I've always written just the book I wanted to write and, um, and I'm happy about those books. Those are the books that I love the most. They're the books that get the most response from readers. And if they, um, and the jokes that I tell are the jokes that make me laugh when I'm all by myself in my office. And I think if I laugh, someone else will. And if they don't, I already laughed. And so done. Uh, the one time when I wrote for a market rather than writing the exact book that I wanted to write was when so my first book was Dating Advice. And when I, uh, when I wrote it, I did all these events all around the country and, um, and I had, you know, I originally written the book for like women who were like in their 20s and 30s who sort of make all those errors that we all make. And um, and I went to all these events, but I kept having these like 80 year old women show up at these events who had not dated in 50 years and wanted oh, to get back after them. Right. And so I thought like, oh, my gosh, I need to like write a dating book for like 60, 70, 80 year old women, because at the time, like, eight, you know, 70 year olds were like the group of people who were the most likely to get like a sexually transmitted disease because they hadn't thought about that in like 50 years. Right. And so I was super passionate about this idea and I had been all over the country and met these women and I knew what questions they were asking. I knew that they wanted to know. And I was so on fire about writing this idea. And I, um, and I wrote a proposal, my agent sent it out and and i was coming off another best selling dating book so you know I, I i felt really strongly about this but i also had like a really good market going into this and both the publisher and my agent really was you know they were like well you know i we just don't think that there's this market for this and we really you know can we just stretch it out can we do it for 40s 50s 60s and i think you guys all know like the dating needs of a 40 year old woman or woman are a lot different than what an 80 year old or 70 year old woman are looking and i yeah. wrote that i wrote that book and i hated uh... it <laughs> And I was, there's still good advice in there, but it's not, I felt so, I felt like I betrayed what I wanted to write about. And it was a mistake. I quickly moved on to the next book. And um, yeah, I felt, and I felt like I never really, uh, you know, gave that audience what they need. I tried to, but, you know, I'm also doing it like, you know, a mother with like 14 kids where you're trying to give everybody what they need, but there's just not enough hours in the day. So the lesson, the big lesson that I've taken away from that is to write the book that you want to write. And Stephen King, actually, since Carol mentioned this in On Writing, said the same thing. Like he felt bad for years that he wanted to write these horror books, like it was less highbrow than what he was capable of or something. But those are the books that he loves to read. And I think we all saw his career. It's turned out OK. He's done all right with that. Yeah, I think that there was an interesting kind of overall tone in on writing well that kind of leaned more toward being a bit more literary, a bit less um, how did breezy breezy was the term he used <laughs> that breezy writing, which I thought that in particular did not age well because you know in the age of these internets, uh -huh. you know, blogs are a thing. And that breezy writing is what has sold a lot of books and has gotten people on a lot of newsletters and on a lot of 
blogs and websites. So that was one thing that I felt was a bit, well, antiquated. Um, what was, was there any other points that you kind of felt like, uh, this could have used a little bit of an update? Um, <laughs> uh... There were there were several things I think I mean, the entire back. second the entire second part <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> was yeah. very dated to me. <laughs> that's a good that's a good way to say it. Yeah. So part two was unity, the lead, and the ending bits and pieces. There's um four parts by the way, audience. In case y'all didn't know, so was. See, I I felt like the bit about um, the breezy writing and also the bit about humor and that example of <laughs> the women wearing hair curlers. And it was 1967. He looked around and all these women had curlers in their hair. So he wrote, he wrote some things. And I was just like, oh, come on. Buddy. Yeah. I thought it took dedication to the fact that he created his own magazine with these humorous stories just for this one thing that was bothering him. That's a meeting. I was like, really? Really? Yeah. And yet Irma Von Breck made an entire career out of hair curlers. And you know, I yeah. yeah, I I don't know. It was it was interesting. Uh yeah, it was interesting. I, I, thought, I oh, go ahead. I, I thought the disconnect was really more towards um because if you're thinking about, you know, who your audience is and who you want to write for, a lot of the terminology and a lot of the concepts that he was presenting in the book don't really match up with what people like at this particular moment want. And it's even more prominent because if you take into account that this edition was updated in 2016, you know, or 2006, 2006. 2006. Was, mm -hmm. Yeah. So even like the way that we read and the way that we want our literature has drastically changed. Like it's always changing, it's always evolving. So this book is technically like it's 15 years too slow for what people want right now. Um, like I, if he, if they did an update on this, I would actually be very curious about what their take on uh, platforms like Wattpad would be. Um, even though I know that's more of a fiction thing, mm -hmm. but a lot of people are generating or or kind of trafficking towards that because of the ease it is to read it, the free access, and all that other stuff. Like. You know, it, time's changing, y'all. Times are changing. <laughs> I'd be interested. There was one thing I noted that uh, his section on sexism and how he, even in this updated version, he switched most of his, he kept most of his pronoun usage to he and him and how he hated using singular they and them. And I'm just like, dude, <laughs> welcome to 2020. <laughs> that did not age well, sir. Yeah. Although I, I still had like, um, I still had arguments with English teachers in the last five years where people have still had that aversion to using they and them as a, as a uh, singular pronoun. And I, it was it was not until like the New York Times adopted it that then that like okay okay if the New York Times does it it's okay but it took a long time for people to and it's just like we've clearly needed it for a long time why all of the because English I'm not gonna get on the soapbox too long but <laughs> English teachers ruin authors and they ruin writers um, because and I say this from personal experience as somebody who worked in a high school and somebody who worked in a college. The most difficult people that you encounter when it comes to writing are going to be the English department. And then they're going to push their idea and their narrative about how writing should be onto you. And I got into a fight with one English teacher in high school because she was like, well, you know, if you're going to write a book, you have to do it this way. And I was like, really? And they were like, yeah. It's like, so what book did you write that you use this law? And it's like, well, I didn't write a book. I was like, but you're telling other people how to write books. No, they you write yourself. Yeah. Do you even write like you do journals? Do you do anything? And they were like, no, I'm an English teacher. And I was like, <laughs> All right, I'm done. Well, this is how I this is like the great pet peeve of my life and English teaching in general. And I've had some excellent English teachers throughout my life. But the thing that always bothered me is that they require students to learn how to write by using an outline and then building an essay. When I was talking about this sort of plotters versus pantsers, there are a lot of people that don't know what is going to be in their outline until they spend hours writing. 
And I have had so many conversations with people over the years who said that they wrote their whole English paper first and then did the outline after that so they could turn it in. And I certainly, right? Okay, so it's something that happens a lot. And yet all those people, many of them who grew up to be pantsers and published many, many, many books, they all felt like they were they couldn't do it right or they were doing it wrong in some way because of this rigidity that we all have to do it this way with an outline. Yeah, and cuz yeah. that's a rubric thing. Like the one the one thing that I will give the the teaching department is that they do have to follow a rubric because they do have to meet certain standards and it has to be yeah. measurable. That's the sure. thing. You can't measure an idea but you can measure an outline. So Right. I had a really good English teacher in that case because she did tell warn us all. She was like, some of you are not going to want to do this outline first. I'm requiring you to turn the outline in first. But if it helps you to write it first, do that and then create your outline based on it. And I was like, yes, that that's great. That's great. Yeah, I'm really hesitant to to paint all um, English teachers. Oh, with no. One broad strip because for one, I studied English education. <laughs> How dare you? And two, um, I think that the the thing about English and writing is that, yeah, there are a multitude of ways for you to do it, to execute it. But how many ways can you reasonably teach it? it within like you know one hour, a couple, few hours a week, right. and so that like you're trying to give students the tools so that they can figure it out later. Like right. this is just the base point. And I, though I do agree that making the students feel as though if you do this this way and you try to vary from it, then you're wrong and you're right. a bad writer. And like that, I don't think that's the way to execute it either, but I don't that know. Really the main, for me, that's really the main thing. And then again, going back to my friend Lisa, her her she had an English teacher that told her that she could never be an author because she was a terrible speller. It's just like right. I'm not a great speller. You know, <laughs> I have I have a great uh, glossary and like you know, I have grammarly, like the dictionary kind of, is my friend. It is right. It is your friend. That was it. I, I just remember thinking like, that's horrible. It's like, so not a part of writing. I mean, it's important to, you know, check those things out as you're doing it, but it's not something that's a barrier to entry. You could be a great writer, which she is and a terrible speller, which she also is. Like the, it's a learned I, skill. It's a learned skill too. Just just to say mm -hmm. that you can't do something because you haven't learned how to do it is like one of the things that irks me on the most. Like I'm a terrible speller and like I was a horrible speller. Like I true story, I didn't learn to read until I was 10. Do you think my spelling was good when I was 10? Mm -mm. So it's it's a thing that you have to learn, that you have to practice. And so if you come at somebody, especially a child or an adolescent, and said, You can't do this because of XYZ, congratulations, mm -hmm. you have literally changed the course of their path that they're going to take right. because your impact on their decision making is huge. Mm -hmm. Like it is, and that's what that's the thing that breaks my heart. So I have thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> so um, going back to the tyranny of the final product, that was that's the title of one of the um, chapters. Um, this fixation on the finished article causes writers a lot of trouble, deflecting them from all the earlier decisions that have to be made to determine its shape and voice and content. It's a very American kind of trouble, which I thought that was an interesting statement. We are a culture that worships the winning result, the league championship, the high test score. Coaches are paid to win. Teachers are valued for getting students into the best colleges. Less glamour gains made along the way, learning, wisdom, growth, confidence, dealing with failure, aren't given the same respect because they can't be given a grade. So I I feel like we kind of moved into this segment accidentally and I, I'm glad for it. So when I am thinking about my writing and my books, like when I'm thinking about my fiction writing, I'm thinking more of the end project product. When I'm thinking, when I'm writing blog posts or if I'm writing articles, um, I have an outline and I'm working from that. Whereas with my fiction, it's more of like super duper loose 
some points that I'm going to hit, but mostly it's pantsing. Um, but I, but with my books, I'm much more worried about that end product. What's it going to look like? How are people going to react to it? Am I going to hit these marks? You know, am I writing to market, et cetera, et cetera. Um, how do we kind of pull back from the focus on the end product to enjoy the process more? That's a good question. <laughs> That's a really good question. Answers, you guys talk. I have thoughts, but I always have thoughts. So basically we're trying to figure out how to close the door so we can focus on writing and not everything that happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have I have to walk away from the internet. <laughs> That's literally what I have to do. Like I have to turn the Wi-Fi off and just write for a while. Um, or one of the things that I try to do that makes me not um, think too much or actually like, like writing sprints are actually really good. And if they're timed like that, um, so it's like, I've got 15 minutes to write as much as I can, and I'm not going to think too much about it. But like, if like the moment I leave the writing sprints, I'm like, okay, I'm going to go ahead and finish off my, my 2000 words I'm going to write for the day. I'll sit and like spend hours trying to figure out how to write like the last 500 words because I'm too busy about trying to decide like, does it meet this beat? Is this the dialogue that it needs to be? Is there correct conflict? Like I start like over analyzing everything when I'm given the time to. So I also write when I'm sleepy. Um, because then my brain doesn't actually work to think about all that stuff as well. So that's why I'm a morning writer. Um, that's interesting. Yeah. That's, a, it, that's an interesting viewpoint. That's really interesting. Hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I Yeah, I tend to, like, once I'm in the writing, um, I tend to write for long stretches at a time. And I, don't, I really get super immersed in the story. And I don't generally... Um, I'm not usually having that issue. I do find that I sort of question myself more when I'm writing things during sprints. Like I, this piece, the book that I'm working on now is much more disjointed and much, uh, and needs more editing work than my work normally does. And I think it's because I wrote it during nano. It was all, and, and the thing is, I was not any more productive writing every day or almost every day during nano than I was that I am just in my normal everyday writing life. But there is, and I really enjoy the sprints because definitely get that word count in and I like the energy and the camaraderie of it. But I think, I feel like I'm almost the opposite where I am, where I need to go back and I end up sort of more in my head uh, when, when I do writing in quick sprints. So I'm basically the opposite of you, Caro. And I need to wait. <laughs> I need to write when I'm awake. Otherwise, I eat a lot of sugary snacks. And I tend to write at night. I am the opposite of you. I'm like the anti-caro. Okay. <laughs> By the way, for those of you who are just joining us, this is Writer's Workshop. It's a nonfiction book club. And we are talking about this book on writing well. Um, I think there's a link for this book in the description. And if you're <laughs> discussing and you want to pick up a copy, you definitely should. So, Sky, what do you think about the the final product versus the uh, process and how to focus more on the process? I mean, I feel like I focus too much on the process because I have yet to actually finish a thing quite to the final product form yet. Let's be real. <laughs> So uh, I got a pre-order for your book coming out in June, so I hope it's finished, ma'am. <laughs> that one technically, is oh geez. So <laughs> I don't know. Your betas have got you back. The sprints definitely help. I I do even when I'm not doing live streams like yesterday. Uh, yesterday was Friday. I don't think I joined anyone's live streams, even in the comments section, but I was writing all day and it, I set my timer and I just got to work and I did stuff, stopping only in between sprints to eat and get drinks and go to the bathroom, basically. Right. So, do mom stuff. Do mom how, stuff. How we far are you that. in the book now? Which one? <laughs> the one that you're working on that you're trying to get done. It's done. I just have to do a final read through and edit kind of thing. It's just not at the 
we are we are completely done with it. Let's just hand it to readers and let them tear it apart and tell me it sucks. Point. <laughs> okay. So Amber said one of the reasons I handwrite is so I can physically go places if I need to or there are no live streams going on. Um, I find that I handwrite poetry more than I do fiction, but if I do handwrite fiction, it's because I'm kind of stuck and it allows me to think in a different way. Like I think more by rote if I handwrite. Yeah, I'm the exact same way. I will switch. I'll switch keyboards. I'll go to a different place. I'll switch to my little um, little iPad and and keyboard. I'll handwrite. Yeah. If, anytime you're stuck, if you can just switch the the go anywhere. Movement. Yeah, go anywhere. Go sit in the backyard, sit on the front porch. Right. And that's actually scientifically proven, too. Um, I can't remember who it was off the top of my head, but they said that in order to stimulate the brain when you're writing, there's two things that you can do, which is expose yourself into a different environment because the stimuli is going to trigger different parts of your brain. Right. And then the other thing that they said is that if you're having trouble writing, to actually take a couple of moments to edit your previous pages because that will get your brain activated for writing and editing. So then when you move into the part that you need to write, then you will be able to move into it more seamlessly than before. That was, I got to find out where that got that from because it was really smart. I, another thing that you can do if you're stuck is walk. There have actually been a number of studies that found if you, especially for women, we are, our brains are more um, sort of attuned to this, but it works for both sexes, just works better for the ladies, uh, is that if you are stuck and you go outside and take a walk for 10 minutes, it actually stimulates creativity. And so if you find that you're, and you don't want to go for like a two hour walk, um, but if you just go out and, you know, take a brisk walk around the block uh, for 10 minutes and then come back, you, the writing often just picks right back up again. Yeah, that came from uh, a Japanese walk. Walk. <laughs> that came from a Japanese philosophy. It's called an air bath. So when you're feeling slow and sluggish, they say to go outside and get an air bath, a.k.a. go take a walk for like 10 minutes at like at the very minimum. So, yeah. See, there you go. Sarah says I changed my desktop background every two hours because that was proven to help. Interesting. That is interesting. Okay. And she sometimes changes the fonts. I've definitely um, changed fonts when I'm editing mm -hmm. because then it's like it's like I'm looking at a totally new manuscript. Yes, I agree with that. I trick my brain into thinking that you know. I, I'm the terrible writer. I write all first drafts in the hated font of Comic Sans, and then no! shift it into the font. <laughs> it helps, you. I swear to God, it helps me. I don't know what it is about that font, but it helps me write a first draft. Whatever works. <laughs> exactly. And that's what we're talking about, right? Figuring out yeah. what works for us. Mm -hmm. um, let's see. Camille says, I write a paragraph for brainstorming for the three acts, discovery, write, draft one, create a chapter outline from draft one, and then rewrite. Third round is a chapter by chapter workshop. And Joel says, I write everything on paper first so I can write anywhere. But when I go to create my zero draft, I put it all on PC. So I don't have to think too much and get distracted. All right, good. Take it. And the neck of flyer flies with you. She wow. likes comic stands for font for her first drafts too. Really? That's phenomenal. I use, uh, uh, when I'm writing first drafts, I generally will um, write with Georgia or some other serif font. Bodoni, I use that a lot. But usually a serif font because it's easier to read. Yeah, it's easier to see. That's what I do for editing, is I switch it to a serif font afterwards. All right, interesting. Fascinating. I did, uh, one thing I did like, which I don't think is actually going to help in my um, writing, but it is something that I have noticed in the world and I was sort of glad to see someone put it on paper. And that's when he's talking sort of earlier in the book about how language, before the bracket talk, about how language has gotten so, um, how we, so it's, it's so cluttered that basically instead of saying just my friend, we say my personal friend or instead of oh, saying the profession. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. And how, and the way he talked about it, which is, was one of those things that as soon as someone says it, you go, yes, that is the case. 
that all this sort of co corporate speak and government mm -hmm. speak is, um, and I love this analogy that it's basically just dust in the eyes of the public that it's this sort of wordy, you know, smoke screen to confuse people intentionally. So they don't pay attention to what you're doing, like uh, layoffs or, you know, going to war, things like that. Yeah. But, yeah. I will say that I want to take that chapter where he talks about that stuff, especially the one that was directed towards when he had a, a conference workshop with a whole bunch of principals and instructors. And I'll like, can I just send that entire chapter to my kids' school? You should. Just that entire chapter. They need I, it. I like this. Um, he pulled out going on with what you're talking about, Lisa. Um, he pulled out this bit from uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt mm -hmm. um, when he oh, tried to convert that. English, his own government's memos, such as this blackout order of 1942. I'm going to read this order to you guys in case you haven't read it, just so you can see how much is like, who's going to see this and be like, oh, okay, I get it. Such preparations shall be made as will completely obscure all federal buildings and non-federal buildings occupied by the federal government during an air raid for any period of time from visibility by reason of internal or external illuminations. Tell them, Roosevelt said, that in buildings where they have to keep the work going to put something across the windows. Like, that's <laughs> what it meant. <laughs> and when I read that, I was like, yes. Yeah, take the jargon out. It's unnecessary. And I feel like another thing he mentioned was, you know, if you don't speak super formally, then don't write that way because it sounds yeah. very artificial right. and it's hard for the reader to actually discern what you're trying to say. And I think that's really important. Even when like Kara was mentioning with like her correspondence with her classes, like initially you were writing and it was much, it sounds like it was much more um, it was very jargon formal. filled and formal. Right. Yeah. So like originally when I first started college, like I had one TA that got on me and they said that you need to use more academic um, uh, vernacular when you're working in these discussion posts, which is his way of saying you need to use college words instead of your five cent words. And I was like, okay, I see you. Um, and, you know, I adjusted accordingly. But now that like, I'm kind of at the end, um, you know, I, I'm just like, why not just like let my voice show in the writing instead. So I'm still trying to like keep that vernacular in the in the writing itself. And I'm also trying to make sure that people can hear me when I talk. And that's something important that you guys can do when you do things like your newsletter or your blog post or your website updates, like let people hear you. That's that's one thing that I usually hear from individuals who read um, like my nonfiction stuff. It's they're always like, I can actually like hear you talking when I read this. And that that's a huge compliment for me. So yeah, I, I think that's I think that's true, but I would like extend that to say that we want to hear you in your books too. You know that that not I don't just want to see the author's you know person come through in their blog posts and then read something else in their actual books. That's sort of the magic I think is your unique take your perspective your sense of humor your way of looking at the world that's what makes an author's voice so strong and so i think that's i, I think it's really important to sort of let you shine through no matter what it is you're writing mm -hmm. what's camille's question so how would you say just developing a distinct voice or a literary style while also cutting down on jargon. Mm -hmm. um, like the first part of this book goes all pretty about well that. into that. Mm -hmm. so, but um, one of the things that happens when you kind of simplify your writing, it ends up that your meanings are clearer and your voice ends up actually becoming a bit clearer because it takes out all this stuff that would maybe obscure your meaning. Mm -hmm. And of course, when he was talking, he was talking more about nonfiction writing as opposed to fiction writing. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's more room for play when it comes to fiction than with nonfiction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But, but I feel like like the advice that y'all were giving about like how to make your newsletter sound more like you, how to make your blog posts sound more like you, 
talking like instead of using a very formal tone that puts this distance between yourself and your reader, trying to connect with them on more of like a person to person basis, as opposed to this is my product. Mm -hmm. Let me sell it to you. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if Camille did a newsletter and I read it and I didn't see the word y'all in there at least three times, I'd be like, <laughs> you didn't write this. Yeah. Right. Who is this? this is There's no sweet tea in here, man. I know. Yeah. <laughs> like, don't be, I, like, don't, like, you're, like, everybody has a very, like, amazing voice. And I always love being able to pick it up when I read something. Like, that's, like, I'm going to, I'm going to pick on Tamara because I got Tamara's poetry book. Um, yeah, I got it. And I read it. And I really enjoy it because when I read her poetry, I can actually like hear her talking. Right. And 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 I'm not going to lie. Like there's somebody who go, when I used to go to my physical writing group, when I would go to my physical writing group, there's a woman there that brings poetry. And even though she's reading it to me, like it doesn't sound like her because the moment she stops reading the poetry and then she starts talking, I'm like, this is like, I don't know who. Is I don't know. Who, yeah, it's just completely different. That she did a po poem about stuff that was in her bag. Oh. Amber said, I liked when he said we have become a society based on a fear of revealing who we are in our writing. That makes me want to strive to, to beat that fear back. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, it, it is a really good point. Oops. Meadow says, I honestly can't tell if my own voice is in my book. Ask I think people to read it. Yeah, I think that you're, but you're, isn't this your first book? Mm -hmm. It's like, this is developing a voice takes time it takes practice it takes writing like mm -hmm. you can't expect to do your first one and to have everything on lock you know like it's like it's like anything else you have to practice it you'll get there yeah you'll get there give yourself that space to learn and expand and explore your writing and what mm -hmm. you're trying to do yeah i'm i know that you guys get this question too but i often get the question from people who are just starting out who want to write and they, or who have started to write a book, but they're horrified about the idea of their mother reading their sex scenes or their, you know, some other person reading their book and that they're the whole time they're writing their work with this fear of somebody who might read it. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's probably one of the most, that fear is probably the most stifling thing that any writer has to face, whether you're fearing failure or whether, although fearing failure can keep you writing, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're failing is not eating, then you're going to be super motivated to make the whole thing work. Mm -hmm. But well, to quote, quote Dune, fear is the mind killer. Well, and yeah. you know, it really does when you are it's afraid. Oh my <laughs> I'm sorry, it just hit me right there. But like <laughs> when you are afraid, your brain function shuts down. Like all the creativity, all that, like you're just your little, like this, this is an actual drawing right here. Your amygdala takes over and its whole job is to get you away from the bear. Like it's not good for writing. Mm -hmm. And so if you're writing, right, if you're writing constantly afraid of what your mother-in-law might think of the sex scene, which first of all, she's your mother-in-law, so she might like it for, I mean, might be weird at Thanksgiving, but, you know, she clearly knows how it works because, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> there, was, there was one romance book and it had the most amazing dedication in it and it was like to my mother who always inspires me to be blah 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 you know all that heartfelt stuff and then it said P.S. Mom please skip all the sex scenes I love you bye yeah oh my gosh yeah well and that's it you're like you've been warned now I can just do my thing so yeah, yeah. yeah. My mom read my first like erotica and that was an embarrassing time for us both. Like <laughs> she, it was almost as bad as that time that she no. So she was reading so she was reading the erotica and like 
why did I have to be in the room, mom? <laughs> why was that necessary? <laughs> so she's like red faced and I'm red faced and like trying to look at anything and like disassociate. I'm not here. I'm not here. <laughs> and, and she said that she liked it. So oh, that was great. I told I told my family when I I told my family when I came out with dressed up I was like you can tell me that you you bought it that's fine I don't want to hear your thoughts on it like <laughs> my my mom will I, I do not write erotica I write you know I write romance generally the like I the sex is uh, off stage not completely but a little bit of it off, the main part is off stage often. But you know what's really funny is my mother will often like her book boyfriends are my characters, and I just and she'll like refer to them later like, "Ooh, that whole piece is dreamy," which for your mother to do that is a little bit. Love you, Danny. Yeah. Oh my yeah. god. I know. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> the 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 that I've read my past. So, <laughs> like, okay. <laughs> So we are we are nearing to the end of this hour, and I feel like we've had a wonderful conversation. I love that we're ending on this note. I couldn't be more pleased. So, so how about final thoughts on on writing well? Would you recommend this for our uh, modern day writers who are here or watching this the replay? No, <laughs> just coming out. I'll say no. <laughs> Yes, and uh, I feel like it, it needs another update. I feel yeah. like it needs another update. Definitely. Yeah. I think it I would recommend part part one. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Go ahead. That was all. Okay. So I, I would recommend part one because I think some of the lessons about simplicity, clutter, uh, I think those parts had some value in there. But the rest of it, I really felt like... Um, I think the rest of it was more appropriate like 15 years ago in some cases. And it's a long, it's not the best book on the topic. I really liked part one and I really liked part four. Okay. Um, part four was talking about like the sound of your voice, um, enjoyment, uh, fear and confidence, um, mm -hmm. the theory of the final product, a writer's decision, writing family history and memoir, write as well as you can. I think that, um, the thing with this book is that you would need to go in recognizing that he is not discussing blog posts. He is not discussing how um, the reader's expectations have changed in the past 100 years. Like, so right. I feel like it can be a helpful read if you go in knowing that if you go in knowing that, I guess. Um, again, so the link is in the description. Um, for the Amazon. Also, if you look at like bargainbooks.com, you can find it cheaper. I felt like it was overpriced on Amazon, but that's just me. It was overpriced on Amazon. Yeah, I know. I, was, I saw like I saw like that price, and I was like, I'm sorry. Like, did you forget that writers don't get paid very much? Like, yeah. I was so I was so ticked off when I saw that. I was like, no, this is not what I want for people. No, I'll, that said, on the plus size, uh, on, not plus size, plus side, on the plus side. <laughs> what, my side? Uh, <laughs> on the plus side, uh, the book is most likely very readily available in most library collections. Mm -hmm. so, That's absolutely. Right? It is a good resource. Um, I clearly did not, at some point, decided to get rid of it because I have, you can't tell. I have a ton of writing books, and it's very hard for me to get any give away any writing book that I have gotten something out of, and um, and I don't have that one in my collection anymore. I had to buy it again. So, of course, part of that's like I didn't recognize it until I started reading it. But yeah, I, when I look for it, I don't have it. So next month's read is going to be how to write dazzling dialogue the fastest mm -hmm. way to improve any manuscript by james scott bell and as you can see this kindle is 3.99 so it's the right price oh and look i purchased this um in february how about that mm -hmm. so we will be <laughs> you get to look at me uh figuring out when uh all right so may 
30th. All right. May 30th, Saturday, 2 p.m. Eastern. We will be back at it. I'm in Hawaii. That's what that's nine o'clock. It's <laughs> early for me. You're welcome. So, um, <laughs> so we will be reading this book and discussing it. And y'all, if you want to be able to tell us what to read for the next month, join the Goodreads group. Every month there's a poll. Usually it's like a week before the actual stream. There will be like five books that you can choose. Pick one and whichever gets the most votes wins. And How to Write Dazzling Dialogue won this time around. So, <clears throat> ladies, thank you so much for being here. Would you like to tell the people who you are again, remind them and where they can find you? Sure, I'll go first. Hi, my name is Kara Brown. I am an urban fantasy author and the operations director of, of the World Inc. Who can't say words right now. <laughs> um, on my channel, I talk about writing, I whine about writing, and I discuss books while under the influence of wine, if that's something that you're interested in. Um, you can easily find me and contact me if you want to discuss things. It's the fastest way to do it. It's going to be on Facebook. If you want to hear random drivel come out of my mouth, that's on Twitter. And if you want to watch me draw pretty pictures, that's on Instagram. So that's me. Sky. Hello, I'm Sky. I typically write paranormal romance on the name SD Haggis. Don't currently have anything out. Do have a pre order that Tamara mentioned earlier that I wasn't going to mention. Uh, <laughs> in I called June. you out. <laughs> so that's the thing. And yeah, I just do YouTube videos and you can find me on Facebook most often. Miss awesome. Lisa. I'm Lisa Daly. I'm a traditionally published author of eight or eight and a half books uh, over on my channel. You know how it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, over on my channel, we talk about uh, publishing advice. We do an awesome live stream every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time with Miss Caro up there uh, and lots of awesome other uh, guests. But Caro's our, um, she's there. She's the rock. Uh, and uh, if you are looking to write a book that you are super proud of and get it published, you want to maybe, I hope you check out my channel. There you go. And by the way, we all have live streams and there is a link in the description. It's um, author to write-ins or something like that. So if you are looking for write-ins, you can find us there. Everyone who's listed here and a bunch of other people too. Um, let's see. Lisa's on Wednesdays. Skies are on super early Tuesday morning. Like the rooster isn't even awake. Like the rooster. <laughs> My roosters are. My roosters are. <laughs> but for me, it's uh, like 10 o'clock at night. And then it's 1 a.m. for me. Caro is Tuesday. 7 a.m. for me. 11 or 10 a.m. for me. Caro's is Tuesdays, 1 p.m. Eastern. Eastern. Time. Okay. <laughs> and mine are Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Yes. Time zones. Time zones are a thing. <laughs> so yeah, I'm like, I can't convert <laughs> to other then people's it, stuff. Every everybody here is in a different time zone. <laughs> so you know, it's fine. Everything's fine. So again, my name is Tamara Woods. Thank you so much for being here. Whether you're here while we're live or you're watching this replay, I appreciate you. You are amazing. Otherwise, we'd just be talking to each other about these books, and we could probably do it a little easier offline. So thanks for being here and uh, watching us talk about our mothers reading our erotica. <laughs> <laughs> you can find me in all kinds of different places. I have links down in that description. <laughs> Honey, just look at them. Go through them. We have things. Everyone who's listed here, in addition to the people who are in the comments mm. who support us, all those links are in the description. Go check them out. Subscribe. They are wonderful people. That's why I work with them. Mm -hmm. Also, I have a Patreon, in case you didn't know, and I would love it. I would absolutely feel honored if you would join my cozy community. It's like a buck a month. Hook a sister up. That way I can get, like, you know, a small coffee from McDonald's. How about that? <laughs> How like about coffee. that? Support my coffee addiction. In any case, we will be back at it again in the last Saturday of May. Until then, happy writing. Oh, I might do a pop-up tomorrow. I'm thinking, I'm co contemplating doing a 10K Sunday because I haven't written in like eight days and I, I, gotta, I gotta do it, I gotta do it. So we'll see. Um, you know, subscribe and click on that notification bell and then you'll know for sure. 
And again, thank you so much for being here and we will see you in the next one.